So on any market, we're going to assume that trade between buyers and sellers is mediated by a matching function, which is an aggregate function, which is well behaved, that's going to summarize all the complexity, complexities of the trading process at the micro level. So what, what properties are we going to assume for the matching function? So here we're going to look at general properties of the function, and then we're going to cover a few uh, examples. So in terms of notation, um, the matching function, we are always going to uh, denote it um, usually by M. small m, uh, that's going to be our matching function. Um, so what are the arguments of the matching function and what does the matching function give us? So usually we have big M is going to be small m of uh, S and B. So that's a key relationship. So here, Big M is going to be the number of uh, matches or trades in a given period that we are looking at. Okay, so this is telling us how many buyers and sellers have come together. S, that's the number of sellers. If you're thinking about the labor market, it's the number of unemployed workers who are selling their labor. If you're thinking about the product market, um, it, you know, it, depending on what exactly you're thinking about, um, it's going to be the number of sellers who are available to sell their services. Um, could be, um, could also be like the number of goods that are available for sale, um, you know, depending on the situation. And B, of course, is the number of buyers that are looking to buy uh, these goods. And so uh, we take the number of buyers, we take the number of sellers, and the matching function is going to tell us how many trades are going to, uh, to happen. So just as an example, tip, common example, we can look at the labor market. And so in the labor market, if we apply uh, this relationship, which um, I guess I could, uh, so in the labor market, what would all these things be? So M would be our matching function, but then in that case, uh, big M, that would be the number of uh, jobs that are filled, the number of, of hires in a given period, you know, how many vacant jobs and work, unemployed workers have come together. S would be equal to the number of unemployed workers. And in that case, the buyers of labor, these are just um, the firms, but B here would be the number of vacant Jobs. So that's a typical example. But of course, you can apply that to any other uh, market. So now the question is, which, you know, I said earlier, this matching function is going to be a well-behaved aggregate function. What type of um, restrictions do we impose on M? There are a few natural assumptions. So first of all, we want that M is increasing uh, in both arguments. That means in a given market, if you have more sellers, uh, you'll, tend to, you'll have uh, more trades. If you have more buyers, you're going to have more trades. Uh, if even you know taking the number of sellers as given, and you know that's very natural. Um, if you have for a given pool of sellers, if you have more buyers, you have more options, so you're more likely to 
have a trade. Similarly, if you have uh, a fixed number uh, of sellers, but you have more buyers, well, naturally, you know, you're more likely also uh, to have a trade. So uh, these are very uh, natural assumptions that the more people participate in the market, the more trades you're likely um, to see. Similarly, you're going to assume that if there are no sellers, no buyers, you will have no trades. So that's also a typical assumption. So M zero B is the same as M S zero and it's zero. So you need uh, people on both sides of the market uh, for trades to occur. Um, usually, we also assume not only that the function is increasing in both arguments, but we're also going to assume that it's uh, concave in both arguments. Uh, that is the second derivative is negative. Okay, um, so it means that you know as you add extra and extra buyers, the number new number of trades that occur is going to diminish. Similarly, as you add more and more um, sellers, the extra number of trades is going to diminish. Um, so this is um, fairly common. An assumption that's going to be very powerful and that we make very often is that M as a constant returns to scale. So this is really going to be important in the model that we develop. Uh, and so what that means, of course, is that If you increase uh, the number of sellers and the number of buyers by the same uh, by the same scalar, say lambda, uh, then you're going to get lambda times the number of trades that you had with the initial number of sellers and buyers. So you have constant returns uh, to scale here. And that's true for any lambda, um, okay, for any uh, any scalars, um, and so that's going to be fundamental. And uh, as a result, it's an assumption that has been tested uh, extensively in the literature, uh, in the data. So there has been a lot of empirical tests of the assumption of constant returns to scale, just because it's such an important theoretical assumption. Uh, and we'll see that, um, you know. As far as we know, it's an assumption that has not been rejected uh, in the data. Uh, it does look like in the real world matching function have a constant returns to scale. And so a last thing that is important to keep in mind is that the exact interpretation of the matching function depends a little bit on uh, the time period that we consider. Uh, so if you're considering a discrete time model, If you have a discrete time model, then M is the number of matches or trades that occur within the, uh, the period considered, within the unit of time considered. So within the time period. Okay. And uh, in a world like this, then we know that the number of trades cannot be more than the, uh, you know, the minimum of sellers and buyers, of course. Uh, because if all the sellers have sold their goods, or if all the buy, you know, then, then you cannot have more trade than this. Uh, and so in a world, if we're in discrete times, then usually we have to impose the extra assumption that uh, M of S and B is less than the minimum of the number of sellers and buyers. And if we're in continuous time, things are a little bit different. In continuous time, M is just going to be uh, the flow 
of new uh, trades that are uh, occurring at any point in time. The flow of trade um, per uh, unit time. But because it's a flow, um, in that case, there is no restriction on uh, the, you know, the number of trades that are realized. Then we don't need to impose uh, that the flow is less than the minimum of the number of sellers and buyers. And um, so for that reason, sometimes working in continuous time is easier because you don't need to impose, uh, you don't need to impose a restriction on the matching function. Um, 